Hello everyone and welcome to the Unanswered Questions True Crime Podcast. I have spent hours and hours investigating this. He basically told her that people have been killed. Journalists, independent investigators, people like that disappeared. It frightened her to the bone. There's more to the story than meets the eye. There were rumors of torture and homicide and sexual abuse, all sorts of egregious, horrendous crimes. He was polygraphed three times. Each of those three showed evasions. His resumes were a skeleton of truth. He was mad at the world, and particularly mad at the government. The study that he commissioned that described a fictional terrorist attack. If people have died over this, it means you're getting close to the truth. You don't have to be a conspiracy theorist to say, what the fuck? Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of my new podcast, Unanswered Questions, where every week we'll endeavour to discuss a mysterious unsolved case that has many lingering unanswered questions. So I hope you enjoy and as always leave me some feedback on what you think about the show and rate it as well. Now on to the show. This week we'll be talking about Yuri Ivanich Nisenko, born October 30th of 1927 and died August 23rd of 2008, was a KGB officer who defected to the United States in 1964. Controversy arose in the CIA over whether he was a bona fide defector and he was held in detention for over three years before he was finally accepted as a legitimate defector by the CIA. After his release, he became an American citizen working as a consultant and trainer for the CIA. Now we're going to get into a bit of a biography on Nisenko and his actual defection. So we'll go into the early days of Nisenko. So Nisenko was born in Nikolaev, Ukrainian SSR, now Mykolaiv, Ukraine. I'm so sorry if I butcher those names. His father, Ivan Nisenko, was USSR Minister of Shipbuilding from 1939 until his death in 1956. During the Second World War, Nisenko attended Naval Preparatory School, intending on a career in shipbuilding like his father. After the war, he attended the Moscow State Institute of International Relations, MGIMO, graduating in 1950. On graduation, he served in naval intelligence until he transferred to the KGB in 1953. In the KGB, he worked primarily in the second chief directorate, which was responsible for internal security. Now we get into his defections. So I'm going to read a short piece that was taken from the declassified CIA document referencing Nisenko's defection and subsequent treatment. Quote, Yuri Ivanich Nisenko, an officer of the KGB, defected to a representative of this agency in Geneva, Switzerland on the 4th of February 1964. The responsibility for his exploitation was assigned to the then SR division of the clandestine service and he was brought to this country on the 12th of February 1964. After initial interrogation by representatives of the SR division, he was moved to a safe house in Clinton, Maryland from the 4th of April 1964 where he was confined and interrogated until the 13th of August 1965 when he was moved to a specially constructed jail in a remote wooded area area at Redacted. The SR division was convinced that he was a dispatched agent, but even after a long period of hostile interrogation, was unable to prove their contention and he was confined at Redacted in an effort to convince him to confess. End quote. This office, together with the Office of General Counsel, became increasingly concerned with the illegality of the agency's position in handling a defector under these conditions for such a long period of time. Strong representations were made to the director, Mr. Helms, by this office, the Office of General Counsel, and the Leg- Legislative Liaison Council, and on the 27th of October 1967, the responsibility for Nisenko's further handling was transferred to the Office of Security under the direction of the Deputy Director of Central Intelligence, then Admiral Rufus Taylor. End quote. Nisenko was moved to a comfortable safe house in the Washington area and was interviewed under friendly, sympathetic conditions by his security case officer, Mr. Bruce Soley, for more than a year. It soon became apparent that Nisenko was a bona fide and he was moved to a more comfortable surrounding with considerable freedom of independent movement and has continued to cooperate fully with the Federal Bureau of Investigation and this office since that time. He has proven to be the most valuable and economical defector this agency has ever had and leads which were ignored by the SR division were explored and have resulted in the arrest and prosecution redacted. He currently is living under an alias, secured a divorce from his Russian wife and remarried an American citizen. He is happy, relaxed and appreciative of the treatment accorded him and states, while I regret my three years of incarceration, I have no bitterness and now understand how it could happen. That is all from the CIA document, end quote. 
Nisenko contacted the CIA in Geneva when he accompanied a diplomatic mission to that city in 1962. Nisenko offered his services for a small amount of money, claiming that a prostitute had robbed him of $900 worth of Swiss francs. He claimed to be Deputy Chief of the 7th Department of the KGB and provided some information that would only be known by someone connected to the KGB. He was given the money he requested and told $25,000 a year would be deposited in an account in his name in the West. Then, at a meeting set up in 1964, he unexpectedly claimed that he had been discovered by the KGB and needed to defect immediately. Nisenko claimed that the Geneva KGB residency had received a cable recalling him to Moscow and he was fearful that he had been found out. NSA was later, but not at the time, able to determine that no such cable had been sent and Nisenko subsequently admitted making this up to persuade the CIA to accept his defection, which the CIA did. Now we're going to get into assertions about the Kennedy assassination. So apparently Nisenko claimed that he could provide important negative information about the assassination of President John F. Kennedy, affirming that he had personally handled a review of the case of Lee Harvey Oswald, who had lived in the Soviet Union in the late 1950s and early 1960s. Nisenko said that while the KGB had conducted surveillance of Oswald, it had never tried to recruit him. This issue was critical because KGB involvement with Oswald might suggest Soviet involvement in the Kennedy assassination, a prospect that could have propelled the Cold War into a nuclear war. Nisenko insisted that after interviewing Oswald, it was decided that Oswald was not intelligent enough and also too mentally unstable, a nut, and therefore unsuitable for intelligence work. Nisenko also stated that the KGB had never questioned Oswald about information he might have gained as a US Marine, including work as an aviation electronics operator at Naval Air Facility Astugi in Japan. Now we get into concerns that Nisenko was a triple agent. So the CIA's Soviet Union division suspected that Nisenko was a KGB plant. One reason was that although he finally admitted that he was only a captain instead of a lieutenant colonel, claiming he had exaggerated his rank to make himself attractive to the CIA, the official KGB documents he had initially provided were examined by the CIA and proved that Nisenko was indeed a lieutenant colonel. A second reason was that an earlier KGB defector, and I'm going to butcher this name, to apologize, Anatoly Goltsin had predicted that the KGB would send someone after him to try to discredit him. Many in the CIA thought Nisenko fitted this picture partly because one of Goltsin's main claims was that the KGB had a mole deep in the CIA and Nisenko claimed there was not. Nisenko was seized by CIA officers in Washington and from 1964 to 67 was subjected to increasingly harsh and hostile interrogation methods including being held in solitary confinement in a CIA safe house in Clinton Maryland in an operation approved by CIA director John A. McCone. The situation was made more complex by another alleged defector controlled by the FBI, Cone named Fedora, a KGB agent who posed as a Soviet diplomat to infiltrate the United Nations and provide false information to the Americans. Fedora was later revealed to be a KGB colonel named Victor, and I'm going to butcher this name as well, Mikhailovich Lesovsky. Fedora confirmed Nisenko's story about Oswald and that he was indeed a KGB colonel and genuine mole. At that point, the Nisenko issue evolved into an inter-service confrontation. To the CIA, Nisenko was not a genuine KGB mole because he was found to have lied about his grade and his recall orders to the USSR, but the CIA accepted him as genuine as agreeing that Nisenko was a KGB plant would consequently compromise the credibility of Fedora, the only Soviet source corroborating Nisenko's story. Now, two lie detector tests conducted by the CIA suggested that Nisenko was lying. Nisenko claimed that the results of the first polygraph were prearranged in a way to break him, while prior to the second polygraph, he was examined by a doctor who inserted a gloved finger inside Nisenko's rectum and over his protest, wriggled it around for some 10 minutes. The doctor suggested he liked the degradation. Nisenko said that this was done to anger him and stimulate his blood pressure, a key factor in affecting polygraph readings. Moreover, Nisenko confessed that he had lied to the CIA about his military rank. However, Nisenko passed a third polygraph test given in August of 1968, which also included questions about Oswald. Part of the evidence against Nisenko, however, was from the work of defected KGB major and CIA agent Peter Derebin. Derebin apparently had worked in the same parts of the Soviet KGB where Nisenko had claimed to have worked, but found the details of Nisenko's stories, which changed over time, to be very unconvincing. Years after the incident, Derebin still believed Nisenko was a KGB plant. 
The fact of the matter is, Peter Derabin noticed many inconsistencies and errors in Nisenko's accounts. For example, Nisenko could not describe in detail how such a KBG file check is done. Nisenko, having ostensibly served as a security officer for delegations, could not even explain how Soviet citizens are checked before going abroad. And finally, Nisenko knew so little about day-to-day -day procedures that one can only conclude that he had never been a KGB officer, at least not in Moscow. End quote. When the interrogations led to no substantial results, the interrogators were changed, and after a new team was brought on, Nisenko was cleared of all suspicions and released with pay. The question of whether Nisenko was a KGB plant is controversial, and those who handled him still initially believe that his unsolicited walk-in was designed by the KGB to protect a Soviet mole threatened by Golitsyn's knowledge and his defection by a Soviet desire to discredit the idea of a connection between the Soviet Union and the actions of Lee Harvey Oswald. Others, however, have argued Nisenko was ultimately regarded as an authentic defector through misinformation from another KGB agent that was thought to be a genuine defector, codenamed Fedora. Fedora corroborated Nisenko's authenticity and allegations, specifically that he was indeed a lieutenant colonel of the KGB and that he indeed received recalling orders just before fleeing to the USA. Nisenko confessed later, after failing to pass successive poly examinations, that he was in reality a KGB captain. While after NSA revealed that no recall orders ever reached Geneva, Soviet embassy, he confessed that he had also lied about that. Now, Nisenko also has later claimed to have been tortured, and even at one point he said during interrogation he was given LSD and it almost killed him. The guards revived him by dragging him into a shower and altering the water between hot and cold. These claims have been denied by Richard Helms, however, who was Director of Central Intelligence during the most intense part of Nisenko's interrogation. Goltzen's defection led the KGB to notify 54, and I'm going to butcher this, Residentura to temporarily suspend all meetings with important agents. The KGB also made significant efforts to discredit Goltzen by promoting disinformation that he was involved in illegal smuggling operations. After five years, in 1967, KGB assassination and sabotage section under, and I'm going to butcher this name, Viktor Vladim Vladimirov, finally discovered Goltzen's CIA hideout in Canada and attempted unsuccessfully to assassinate him. Nisenko's case officer was Tenant H. Pete Bagley, both when they first met in Geneva in 1962 and subsequently when he defected in 1964. Bagley, subsequently Chief of Counterintelligence for the Soviet Russia SR Division and Division Deputy Director, wrote a book that was substantially about the Nisenko case. In response to Bagley's book, other members of the intelligence community have re-examined the Nisenko case and repeated Bagley's concerns. CIA Operations Officer George Kizavel well regarded for his prior handling of Major Pyotr Popov, the first Soviet GRU officer run by the CIA and a native Russian speaker, was a detailed asset to Bagley. In 2013, Bagley wrote another book revealing new details he acquired by comparing notes with Soviet KGB Chief Sergei Konzdranshev. Bagley says he had always suspected that Nisenko might be a plant and was glad to have this confirmed by Konzdranshev. Both Bagley and Konzdranshev expressed surprise that CIA had accepted Nisenko as genuine for as long as they had, despite more than 30 warning signs. Now, re listeners, I do apologize if I do get these names wrong. Please do forgive me. Now we get into the aftermath. So, on March 1st of 1969, Nisenko was formally acknowledged to be a genuine defector and released with $80,000 worth of financial compensation from the CIA. He was also provided with a new identity to live out his life in the south of the US. The harsh treatment he received as part of the early US interrogation was one of the abuses documented in the Central Intelligence Agency Family Jewels document in 1973. In an internal note at the CIA in 1978, then DCI Stansfield Turner, referring to Nisenko's solitary confinement, stated, and I quote, the, ex the excessively harsh treatment of Mr. Nisenko went beyond the bounds of propriety or good judgment. At my request, Mr. Hart has discussed this case with many senior officers to make certain that its history will not again be repeated. The other main lesson to be learned is that although counterintelligence analysis necessarily involves the making of hypotheses, we must at all times treat them as what they are and not act on them until they have been objectively tested in an impartial manner. End quote. The case has been examined in several books and the 1986 movie Yuri Nisenko Double Agent starring Tommy Lee Jones. The movie depicted the intense debate over whether Nisenko was an actual defector. He exposed John Vassell, a British civil servant already revealed as a KGB agent by Gotson and eventually charged for spying in 1962. He also helped uncover Robert Lee Johnson, a US Marine in Berlin who was arrested in 1964. 
Nasenko lived in the U.S. under an assumed name until his death. 17 audio files of interviews of Nasenko during the investigation of the Kennedy assassination were made public by the National Archives on July 24, 2017. With that, this case remains open, but with many unanswered questions, it still remain unanswered. Please rate the show and let me know what you guys think about this and the many other cases I've covered. You can follow me on all major social media platforms, YouTube, BitChute, Dailymotion. I'm also on Twitter and Instagram. Links are all down below in the description. If you have a case you'd like me to have a look at or cover, don't hesitate to send me a message. I'm your host, and this has been the Unanswered Questions Podcast. Until next time. Next on Unanswered Questions. Robert Scott Bob Lazar, born on January 26th of 1959, is an American conspiracy theorist and self-proclaimed physicist who claims he was hired in the late 1980s to reverse engineer extraterrestrial technology. 